In today's webinar, we're going to be focusing on Staphylococcus aureus, which is a common pathogen. Staphylococcus aureus, when we go through its microbe anatomy, is actually the term means golden cluster of grapes. So let's break this down. In terms of its gram stain, it stains purple due to its thick peptidoglycan cell wall. It's cocci, so this means it's round shaped, just like grapes and they tend to live in sticky clusters. Why the term golden? When it's grown on blood agar in particular, the colonies have a distinctive golden yellow color, and it's a facultative anaerobe. This means it has the ability to live in both an aerobic and anaerobic environment. It's non-motile and non-spore forming, and it's catalase positive. The catalase test, looks at whether the organism produces an enzyme called catalase. Catalase is an enzyme that converts hydrogen peroxide to water and oxygen. And due to this, it produces foam. This is due to the oxygen content. Now, it allows us to differentiate between staphylococci and streptococci and enterococci. And this is because streptococci and enterococci are catalase negative. So if there's no foam, then it's likely to be streptococci or enterococci. It, we, once we've done this test, we then focus on the fact that it could either be Staphylococcus aureus, Staphylococcus epidermidis, or Staphylococcus saprophyticus. So in order to differentiate between this, we use the coagulase test. And this is because Staphylococcus aureus is a coagulase positive organism. So it produces coagulase, which converts fibrinogen into fibrin. The way we conduct this test is we'll add a few drops of plasma to the emulsion. And if we have the formation of sticky fibrin, then we can be positive that Staphylococcus aureus is present. It's a very common organism and a quarter of the population are colonized by it. It usually lives in the nostrils, the groin and the armpits, and it can live in other parts of the body. It's a part of our normal skin flora. Our skin flora is a complex ecosystem of different bacterial species, and they normally don't cause any problems. But if Staphylococcus aureus dominates this ecosystem, then it can cause a problem and a it can lead to a possibility of infection. Many different factors can affect the amount of Staphylococcus aureus present on the skin. This can include the pH, humidity, sweat, or other organisms present on the skin. How does it cause problems? So if you've got more and more Staphylococcus aureus present on your skin, it can penetrate tiny microfissures in the skin. These microfissures, just as you can see in that picture on the right, these microfissures can be present with conditions such as eczema. Also, if there's larger breaks in the skin due to having a cut due because of shaving or any minor trauma, it can uh, use this as an avenue to get into the skin. It can also cause wound infections when there's a large break in the skin due to trauma or surgery. So as a general rule of thumb, low levels of Staph aureus and intact skin allows it to colonize that area, high levels and breaks in the skin can lead to an infection. So talking about the laser skin and the different problems that Staph aureus can, can cause, if it invades the skin, it can lead to localized skin infections and this can lead to the formation of a pimple. This pimple can then evolve into a furuncle, which is another word for a boil. If you've got several boils that bunch together, this leads to a carbuncle, which is a more severe form. If it penetrates the epidermis, it can cause superficial impetigo, which is an infection of the epidermis. If it infects the dermis, it can cause cellulitis and then it can begin to spread along the skin and this can lead uh, to systemic uh, problems. If 
it infects the subcutaneous tissue further on past the dermis, then it can cause a subcutaneous abscess. And it's important to note that these abscesses can develop within various organs, various organs like the liver, kidney, spleen, or the brain. Now, if the infection is overlying a muscle, it can spread into the muscle and cause a condition called pyomyositis, which is a rare infection of skeletal muscle. And it's usually as a result of abscess formation. If it infects the bone, it can cause osteomyelitis. And if it gets into uh, the septal joint, it can, the, the joint space, it can cause septic arthritis, which you can see uh, on the scan on the right. Now, once it's in the blood, it can cause several problems. It can cause septic thrombophlebitis if it makes its way into the bloodstream, and this causes an infected blood clot. Blood clot. Uh, if it, once it is in the blood, this is called bacteremia. Uh, blood is usually a sterile environment, so we wouldn't expect any organisms to be in the blood. So the presence of Staph in the blood is a problem in itself. And what it can do is it can trigger an immune response. Now, what this immune response does, it causes the blood vessels to expand and the blood pressure to fall. And as a result of this, the patient will experience hypotension and poor perfusion of their organs. And this process in itself is sepsis, which of course is life-threatening. If it makes its way into the central nervous system, it can cause bacterial meningitis. So that's the infection of the protective membranes that surround the brain and the spinal cord called the meninges, or it can cause an epidural abscess, a collection of pus and bacteria between the outer covering of the brain and the spinal cord. If it makes its way into the lungs, uh, it can cause pneumonia and this is of course, is an infection that inflames the air sacs of one or both of the lungs. Uh, these may be filled with fluid of pus, and this is why patients would experience a cough with phlegm or pus. And Staphylococcus aureus is one of the most common pathogens that causes pneumonia. If it makes its way to the heart, it can grow on the heart valves, and they grow uh, these are called vegetations and they damage the heart valve and cause a condition called infective endocarditis. The problem with this is parts of these vegetations can chip off and embolize further, causing local infections around the body. Staph aureus have the ability to create biofilms and they normally do this on medical implants like indwelling catheters, prostatic heart valves and artificial joints. A biofilm, you can think of it as a layer of slime. And if you think of it in the sense of look, thinking of strawberry jam, the seeds in the jam would be the bacteria and the jam would be the extracellular matrix made up of exopolysaccharides or EPS. And over time, bacteria can be completely surrounded by it. And they use this gel-like layer to communicate with each other using biochemical signals. And they can even swap genetic information like antibiotic resistance within this biofilm between different bacteria. So within this biofilm, they'll thrive in this biofilm, but they don't divide rapidly. They don't divide rapidly, but the problem is antibiotics cannot penetrate biofilms very easily. And it makes it very difficult. And sometimes the easiest way is just to remove that surface altogether. Now, alongside all of this, Staph aureus has the ability to produce super antigens or toxins, and they can cause several problems. There's five uh, in particular that are very important to know. The first is toxic. Toxic Shock Syndrome 1, or TSST1, or, and pantin valentine leukocydin toxin, hemolysin, 
exfoliatin and enterotoxin. So let's break down TSST1. It's secreted by Staph aureus and it's normally produced at the site of the infection and can enter the bloodstream. What TSST1 does then, it binds to the major histocompatibility complex 2, which is a receptor found on antigen presenting cells, just like you can see in that picture on the right. And once it attaches to it, it makes the antigen presenting cell release loads of pro-inflammatory chemicals called cytokines. And this produces a cytokine storm. A cytokine storm results in a lot of physio physiological changes, such as fevers, rash, low blood pressure, and poor end organ perfusion. This of course is life-threatening. And this is what we mean when we use the term toxic shock syndrome. Pantan valentin leukocidin toxin, or PVL, is, is when staph, uh, the toxin PVL punches holes in leukocytes. And these are our, our immune cells, and it kills them. And this is what gives it its name. Now, what happens is if this happens throughout tissue, this can lead to necrosis, which triggers inflammation. So if you've got this process happening throughout the lungs, this can cause necrotizing pneumonia, where large ch chunks of the lung tissue begin to die off and the organ cannot do its function properly. Obviously, this would lead to complete organ failure and is life-threatening. Hemolysin. Hemolysin is a toxin um, that, again, is poor forming and it destroys erythrocytes or red blood cells and it, re it releases its hemoglobin, in, it releases the hemoglobin within erythrocytes into the blood. Hemoglobin contains iron, and Staph aureus does this for one particular thing. It allows it, it can use that iron to, for its own metabolism, which I thought was just mind blowing. And then we've got exfoliating toxin, which causes staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome or Ritter's disease. And this is where you've got painful patches of skin with red fluid blisters. And it can often resolve within a few weeks of treatment. Then we've got enterotoxin. Enterotoxin is a term that you've probably heard before because this is how Staphylococcus aureus can cause food poisoning. So Staphylococcus aureus may land on food and then it starts to produce enterotoxin. But this enterotoxin that it produces is very stable in different environments. And what can happen is when you start cooking this food, the Staphylococcus aureus may die, but the toxin it's produced can withstand boiling at 100 degrees Celsius for a few minutes. And what could happen is then you consume this food and it leads uh, to symptoms of vomiting and diarrhea just a few hours after ingestion. And the, the problem with enterotoxin, if it makes its way into the blood, it can also cause toxic shock syndrome. But in terms of treatment, we want to give antibiotics. Antibiotics that we used to use, we used to use penicillins. And penicillins would often uh, be able to bind to the protein binding, uh, the penicillin binding protein, PBP, uh, on Staphylococcus aureus. But the problem that's happened is that Staphylococcus aureus has developed resistance to a lot of the penicillins and has changed. Uh, and the reason why it's developed resistance is due to its ability to produce the enzyme beta-lactamases. Beta-lactamases attack the beta-lactam ring of penicillin, uh, penicillin antibiotics and they render them ineffective. So what we did then is now we use uh, coamoxiclav more often, and coamoxiclav contains clavulanic acid, which is a beta-lactamase inhibitor, which inhibits this enzyme, and it allows the penicillin to have its effect. And then we used to use methicillin uh, for highly resistant strains. However, Staph aureus has also developed resistance to methicillin, 
and these strains are called methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, MRSA. And MRSA has, is of course known as a superbug, um, which, it, which is a nickname often used within secondary care. And the reason for this is it's highly resistant to a large number of different organisms, different antibiotics. So when we talk about MRSA, we can split it into two categories. This can be healthcare associated MRSA. And this is due to the fact that you have a lot more organisms in a healthcare environment and they develop resistance to a lot of antibiotics. Or you can have community associated MRSA. And this could be due to the misuse of antibiotics when they're not required or due to the misuse of antibiotics in the farming industry because there was a large consumption of, consumption of antibiotics by giving these to animals um, in farming processes. So infections caused by these strains cannot be treated with beta-lactam antibiotics. And with a case of MRSA, you'll use glycopeptides such as vancomycin. The problem with this is they're not as effective and you have problematic side effects with vancomycin, such as nephrotoxicity, autotoxicity, and several other uh, side effects. Um, some strains have now developed either intermediate resistance or complete resistance to vancomycin, rendering that option completely ineffective as well. And this is where we have to consider different antibiotics and we the most important thing for this is using culture and sensitivity testing to know what the MRSA is sensitive to and in these cases you could use other options such as clindamycin, tetracyclines or tigacycline. So to summarize Staph aureus is a gram positive coccus that grows in sticky clusters. It's part of our normal skin flora and it's found in a quarter of the population, but if it overgrows or the skin, uh, skin is damaged, it can lead to direct colonization. Um, and or it can also produce toxins and it's very adaptive and has become resistant to a wide variety of different antibiotics. And MRSA strains are classified as either healthcare associated or community-acquired MRSA.